Did you know Jeremy and I, we haven't shared anything. I didn't tell him what I'm preaching or what he tell me what he's preaching. But I believe that God has really orchestrated this and put together some things. I thought that teaching this morning was just awesome, awesome, awesome. And you know, not everybody approaches things the way that I do. Each one of us are different in things. But this is basically the same thing. I was teaching last night is that you got to quit trusting in yourself. And here's the apostle Paul here in Philippians chapter three, saying the same things. We may approach it from a different angle, you know, different strokes for different folks. We're going to come at this and say it so many different ways during this week that praise God, you're going to have to have somebody to help you to miss it. But it's, it's the same thing. I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying to us, Philippians chapter three, verse one, finally, my brethren, Rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You know, it's one of the pressures that preachers have is a desire or a, uh, we feel obligated that you got to come up with something new. But I'm telling you, we need just the same old basic things. Like Jeremy was saying, man, if you know that the Lord said to cast your care upon him, and if you haven't done it, well, then you need to hear it again and keep hearing it until you finally do it. I heard a story about a preacher that went for a uh, tryout, you know, and he preached and he preached a message on John 3, 16. And the people thought it was so good, they accepted him as pastor and voted him in. So the next week he got up and preached and he preached on John 3, 16. And the people thought, well, this is strange. He must have forgotten what he ministered, but nobody said anything. So anyway, this third week he got up and he preached on John three sixteen. People thought this was really weird and said, doesn't this guy know anything else? But nobody, you know, they were polite and they didn't say anything. The next week, fourth week in a row, he got up and preached the same message on John three sixteen. So finally they went to the elders and said, you're going to have to talk to this guy. And they said, if he preaches this again, we're going to say something. So the fifth week he got up and preached on John three sixteen. And finally, they said, don't you know anything else? And he says, look, when you start living what I preach, then I'll preach something different. <laughs> if that's the way that we preached, we wouldn't have to have very many messages. <laughs> but we're always wanting something new. Did you know this is one of the things that happened with Adam and Eve? Satan says, you'll know something that you don't know. You're missing out on something. This is one of Satan's oldest tricks is we've always got to hear something new. Man, if we just operate in what we're already here, we've already heard enough last night and this morning to set you free. Right. If you just operate in it, that's powerful. So anyway, then he says in verse two, says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. You know, this isn't really talking about the animals. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord, man, I just started knocking on doors. We knocked on a hundred doors a day and I made the mistake of th starting in the rich part of town. You know, the Bible says the poor hurt him gladly, but the rich didn't respond very well. And people slammed doors in my face and things like this. And so I just determined I was going to talk to this next woman. I was going to do something. And I was saying, Jesus, give me, give me something I can say. And so anyway, I knocked on the door and this old woman opened the door about like that, had the chain on and she was looking through there. And what do you want? And I said, praise God, I finally found a Christian. And she says, what makes you think I'm a Christian? I said, you got a scripture written on your fence. And she said, what? And she undid that, walked out on the porch. And I said, right here, beware of dogs. Amen. <laughs> and I just kept reading. I read all uh, Philippians chapter three before she recovered and shut the door in my face. Praise God. And then look at this in verse three, it says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You know, this is what I was talking about last night. It's what Jeremy's talking about. When you humble yourself, it doesn't mean that you hate yourself. It doesn't mean that, you know, you don't uh, recognize that maybe you've been to school and you got a degree and there's things you can do, but it's just, you don't have confidence in your flesh. Your flesh is what caused all of these problems. Your confidence is in the Lord. Here's the apostle Paul, the man that wrote half of the books of the New Testament, turned the world right side up. And he says, we have no confidence in the flesh. You know, talking about humility, humbling yourself, crying out for help to a lot of people is offensive. And it's your flesh. It's your, 
your carnal nature that wants to feel like you can handle everything on your own, that's the part of us that gets us into trouble. Over in uh, Galatians chapter 5, I could spend a lot of time over in those verses, but it's the same thing. It says, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, lust, lasciviousness, all of these kind of things. And it lists everything. Did you know if you've got a problem with adultery, you got a problem with pride, with self, with your flesh. If you've got a problem with addictions, alcohol, drugs, you've got a problem with your flesh. If you've got a problem with the temper, a lot of you think, no, I was just born this way. No, you were not born that way unless you were demon possessed at birth. <laughs> you can get delivered. Of it. it doesn't matter what you're dealing with. It's all of this flesh. Your flesh is Satan's inroad into your life. And Paul says we have no confidence in the flesh. And yet our world system today is trying to fill you with confidence, self-confidence. And sad to say, even a lot of Christians are really promoting self-confidence. I see these churches that have self-esteem classes. Man, you aren't supposed to esteem yourself. You're supposed to esteem Christ. And you esteem who He's made you, and there is a part of you that's now been changed, and you esteem who you are in Christ, and you have confidence in Christ, but you are not supposed to have confidence in your flesh. Paul said that we have no confidence in her flesh. And then in verse 4, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Did you know that the phrase trust in the flesh is the exact same Greek word that was used in the previous verse where it says we have no confidence in the flesh? And so by interchanging these and looking at the different ways it was translated, you see that confidence in the flesh is trusting in the flesh, trusting in yourself. You know, I've got a couple of people right now that I've been dealing with. I've been to go see them in the hospital and I've been praying with them and, and stuff. And um, I mean, they are just dependent on the doctors. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not against doctors. If it wasn't for doctors, all the Christians would be dead because <laughs> they haven't been trusting in God. So I'm not against doctors, but I'm saying that there are people that just trust the doctors first. Like Van and Regina were talking about, some of the members of their church called them first. I think that's what the scripture says when you get sick. Call for the elders of the church, not the ambulance. Yes. That's right. I'm not against doctors, but I'm saying it shouldn't be our first line of defense. It shouldn't be the thing we trust in. But I'm dealing with a couple of people right now that have submitted themselves to the doctors and they have relatively minor things, but the doctors are killing them. I mean, physically killing them. One of them lost 20 pounds in 10 days because of the treatments that they're being given. And then they got ulcers in their stomach and all of these things. And I go to pray for them and it says, well, it's these treatments that are doing this, but I've got faith that I'm not going to have any side effects. And I said, man, if you got enough faith to believe that you can have poison put in your body and it's not going to dominate you, well, then you got enough faith to get healed without the treatments. Again, I know somebody's going to misunderstand and think I'm against doctors. I'm not against, I just let the doctors deal with the sick folk. Amen. You've been healed. Why don't you trust God? Why is it that we, why is it, I was talking to this lady, I said, why did you let the doctor say all of this to you? It's like, what do you mean? We're supposed to just totally do whatever the doctor says, not me. You know, I hadn't got anything against veterinarians, but I wouldn't take my dog to a vet. You know why? I hadn't got a dog. I'm not against doctors, but I don't go to a doctor because I believe I'm healed by his stripes. And I guarantee you, you'd have, to, you'd have to catch me. I'd have to be in a coma for them to take me to the doctor. I'm going to stand and believe that I'm healed, praise God. And I know people think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. I think you're weird when you've been healed by the stripes of Jesus and yet you have a pain. You just run and let people speak things over you. You listen to the commercials that tell you all of this stuff and you listen to it. Death and life are in the power of the tongues. I tell you, you got to get violent. 
Hebrew, Matthew chapter 11 says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You got to get this attitude that Regina was talking about to her. She says, put it on speakerphone. And then she speaks to that girl. I know some of, I'd never do that. That's the reason you're sick. You got to get violent. You got to get to a place where I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm not going to live this way. Jesus purchased healing for men. Praise God. I am not going to live below my privileges. You have authority. So he says, we don't have any confidence in the flesh, but it's not because Paul didn't have anything going for him. You know, there's a lot of people that think, well, the reason that you have no confidence in the flesh and the reason that it's easy for you to call out for God is because you hadn't got anything going for you. And that's pretty much true. <laughs> if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. I mean, I was an introvert, couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to him. I'm a hick from Texas. On and on you could go listing all of my uh, things that are wrong. You know, Jamie, my wife, making fun of the way I talk up here today. I had one guy call in and say, we thought you were imitating Gomer Pyle. We thought it was a comedy act. <laughs> Do you think anybody had talked this way on purpose? <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is... Some people, well, it's easy for you to trust God because you just don't have anything going for you. But here's the apostle Paul, who he wrote half of the New Testament. This guy was educated to the max, and yet he had no confidence in the flesh. Did you know, actually, I feel sorry for those of you that are one of these that can just do anything, and you are multi-talented and stuff. Uh, I feel sorry for you in a way because it's actually harder for you to come to the end of yourself and begin to trust God because it's so easy for you to do it. Boy, with me, I honestly just don't have a clue. I do not have a clue what I'm doing. I feel like I'm on a roller coaster strapped in, holding on for dear life saying, Jesus, help. Amen. I did not make anything happen. God is just doing this. And it's easy for me to trust in the Lord. But Paul said, he begins to list all of his great things here in verse five. He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. To us, that doesn't mean a lot. But in Paul's day, being a Pharisee, you were the elite of the elite. You had PhDs, DHDs or whatever those things are, all of these degrees. You could have 32 degrees and still be frozen. Amen. <laughs> but the apostle Paul was somebody special, man. And he, he says, I've got all of these things. But in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, or excuse me, I skipped verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, not sinless, but blameless, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Did you know the word here where it says I count all things? That means to take, to command, to take by force violently. In other words, this isn't natural to esteem your own accomplishments as nothing. It's something that you have to choose to do. You have to knowingly sit there and count all of your great abilities, all of your great accomplishments as nothing and get to where you depend upon the Lord. You know, this is the reason I believe that the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, that you see your calling, brethren, how that there's not many mighty, not many noble called. But God has chosen the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught things that are. And it goes on to say the reason he did it was so that no flesh would glory in his presence. God delights in choosing people that don't have it all together so that when he uses you, he gets the credit instead of you getting the credit. And it's not that God doesn't love people or, or uh, want to use people that have it all together and that are beautiful and have all of these great things going for them, but it's the fact that most people who have their act together, they trust in themselves. They take the glory for themselves instead of giving it to God. And God's not going to share his glory with another person. It's like if you, know, you, wanted, if, if you were hiring somebody and you said, help wanted, and then you list the things that you're looking for, apply within. God says, if you're nothing, 
if you're base, if you're despised, if you're weak, if you're a failure, if you're no good, apply within. And the sad thing is, very few people, well, that's not me. I've got all of these qualities. I don't have to depend upon the Lord. Exactly what Jeremy was talking about. I've got it, not humbling ourselves. Man, that is, God is looking for people. He doesn't care if you've got degrees after your name. He doesn't care if you're a beautiful person, if you're rich, if you're talented, if you're all of these things. God is just looking for somebody who will have no confidence in your flesh. And that you will humble yourself and let him live through you. God is so much more qualified than you are to do anything. You need to get to a place to where you put no confidence in your flesh, but you are trusting in the Lord. I'm telling you, this is the key to everything. I had a woman come up to me in Bible college just a month ago. And this, I was teaching along these lines and this woman shared that she had a traumatic experience happen in her life and she didn't tell me what it was, but it was really bad. And she said she didn't talk to anybody for seven years. I can't even imagine what this was about. I don't know if that was an exaggeration or exactly how she was saying it. But anyway, she said she didn't talk for seven years. And then in her job, she had to start making presentations and doing some things. And so she just forced herself in the natural to take some of these speaking courses and she learned how to overcome and in the flesh, in the natural, she got to where she was making presentations and traveling and doing this. And she'd been doing this for the last 10 years or so. But now that she's in Bible college, here we are talking about ministering out of your heart. And she came to me just with panic. She says, I know how to do this stuff in the flesh, but I don't know how to let God flow through me. And you know what? Most people would look at that as a great success story, but from God's perspective, that woman did not deal with whatever her problem was in a spiritual way. She dealt with it in a carnal way. Most people, it's just, I'm, I've got this goal and I'm going to obtain this goal and I don't care how I get there. Doesn't matter if it's a doctor, doesn't matter if it's going in debt, doesn't matter if it, they'll compromise, they'll do nearly anything as long as they obtain this goal. But there's a right and a wrong way to do it. The Apostle Paul here is saying that he had all of these talents and all of these abilities, but he counted it but dung. That's manure. Or you could use other words that I'm not going to use to describe that. You know what we do with our manure? We frame it and put it on the wall so that everybody can see it. Paul said he counted all of his great accomplishments as done. There's not very many people that will take that approach. Man, we take a lot of pride in all of our accomplishments and all the things that we've done. And you know, the scripture says, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, what do you have? that you didn't receive. And if you've received it as a gift, then why do you glory as if you didn't receive it? Did you know any good thing that's ever been accomplished through you, it's God that gave you that ability. If you can sing, it's God that gave you the ability. You can go to school and you can practice and you can improve, but you can't put in what God left out, amen? If you can sing, God's one that gave that to you. If you've got administrative skills, if you, whatever your deal is, if, you, if you're an artist, if you can build things, if you can do all of this, God's the source of everything. And yet we take pride in this and, and accomplishments and put all of our accomplishments on the mantle and talk about all of the things that we've done. I'm telling you, I don't believe that's a godly attitude. Not godly at all. And yet this is typically the way that it is. People boast and brag about all the things that they've done. I believe that it, there's a place for bragging about what Jesus has done and talking about things, but you give him the credit. You don't take the credit for it. Any good thing that's in any of us, it's because of Jesus. And man, he ought to get all of the glory. You know, all the Lord would have to do is just stir the chemicals in your brain just a little bit. And I guarantee you'd be having drool dripping off your chin. You could, you could lick your stamps off your chin, amen. You didn't make yourself where you have 
this mind and where you think. You didn't cause yourself to be born in the United States with unparalleled opportunity. You didn't do all of this stuff. Man, God is the source of everything, and yet we take credit as if somehow or another we have done something special. You know, I have people come all the time and say, man, what, you know, if you could go back, would you do things over? Would you, would you like to go back and do things over? No, <laughs> man, absolutely not. Because I can look back and see there's a million ways I could have destroyed my life. I could have missed God. I could have been dead. I just, my brother just turned um, 73 on the 29th and I called him to thank him and just, and that guy saved my life. Who knows how many times? Pil picked me off of a swimming pool when I was knocked out. Caught me when I fell off a thousand foot cliff. And I was thanking him again because just two weeks ago today, I stuck my finger in a table saw. I could have lost this finger, but here it is. Praise God. <laughs> and uh, he told me about the saw stop and it saved my finger. And uh, so anyway, I was just thanking him. But you know, I look back, my life could have been so different. It's not my great intellect that's caused God to bless me and prosper me and see my son raised from the dead and my wife raised from the dead. Man, it is so, it is wonderful to have no confidence in the flesh and just get to where you live by the Lord and everything. You go to the Lord and you ask him for direction because you just don't have enough sense to get in out of the rain. It's really a good way to live. And I know what I'm saying is counter to the way most of us have been taught, the way most of us live. But this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. He had no confidence in the flesh, not because he didn't have some natural things that relative to other people he may have looked good. But you know what? The only comparison we should be making is comparing ourselves to the Lord and what he intended us to be. If you're measuring yourself among yourself and comparing yourself with other people, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 12, that you are not wise. And this is what people do all the time. He says that he counted all of these great things that he had accomplished as dung. And here's the reason he did it, that he might be found in him, in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I tell you, if you are taking glory and credit and satisfaction, if your ego is being built up by all of the things that you can do, then you're, you are not finding your life in Christ. You aren't like that verse that Jeremy used, uh, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And he was, his life was in Christ. Everything about Paul was in Christ. He did all of this because he wanted to be in Christ and find his true identity in Christ. You know, if you are, if you're discouraged and beat down because of some failure that happened in your life, I'm saying this in love, but it's because your confidence, your focus is upon yourself. If you are in Christ, did you know you're going to be the same all of the time? If you're a person that's up one minute and down the next and you're like a yo-yo, you're up and down and you're inconsistent in your life, it's because you are trusting in yourself. You are doing things on your own. That's the way that your flesh is. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, when people introduce me, this is strange to me, but when people introduce me, the number one thing that they say is that he's the same. All of the time. Whether he's on the stage or if he's behind the scenes or whatever, he's the same. And I think, what's everybody else? <laughs> what are you saying? But I'm telling you that I have, I'm not perfect. I hadn't arrived, but I've left, praise God. And I'm seeing results. And I can tell you that when you are in Christ, you are going to be the same. I have people criticize me all the time and say, well, you just have no emotions. My staff even put out one of these Spock deals where they had Spock, the Star Trek Spock, and they put my face on him. <laughs> and they call me Android Womack. <laughs> but you know what? I'm a very emotional person. Man, when I see people hurting, I have compassion on them. I love, but when it comes to me, 
I am finding my place in Christ and I am not going to indulge my emotions and I'm not going to just let them go and fall apart like a $2 suitcase because that is not the way that Jesus is. And if you are in him, you are going to be consistent. If you're inconsistent, it's because you aren't in him. Now, you may be positionally in him. You may be born again, but you aren't dwelling in that. You aren't appropriating who you are in Christ if you're up and down. If you got a short fuse, people can tick you off. That is not the way that God is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, God's kind of love suffers long and is kind. But see, there's a lot of people, well, you know, this is just the way that our family is. This is just my personality. And we have excuses for this. That's wrong. It's wrong. Well, I'm a type A personality. It's just the way that I am. No, you're just carnal is what you are. <laughs> you shouldn't be in Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You need to think like him. You need to let him live through you. And if you are in Christ, you'll be like Jesus. You'll be able to turn around to the person who's crucifying you and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You'll be able to cast your care over on the Lord. You can do it. But we compare ourselves among ourselves. And we think, well, this is the way that everybody else is. And even Christians have such a low expectation of living a victorious life. They just expect to be like everybody else. Man, there ought to be a difference between you and people that don't know the Lord. And yet the average Christian is sick just as much as the person that doesn't know the Lord. You're just as poor. You're just as depressed. You get just as discouraged over everything because we're watching the same stuff. We're thinking the same thing. Garbage in, garbage out. But man, when you get to where you're meditating in the Word of God, you can be like the Apostle Paul where you just take by command all of these things and count it but nothing. Father, I don't care. I give all the glory to you. My only thing that I desire is to be in you, to be found in you, not having my own righteousness, which is based on my performance. But Father, the only thing that counts is what you think about me. That's the way that we need to be living, brothers and sisters. And when you get to where you're like that, it just, it limits Satan so much. You know, Satan's temptation that he came against Adam and Eve with was, you know, saying that you aren't like God. You are, God is holding back on you. And he tempted them and it actually was pride. They thought I'm missing out on something. I need something. When the truth was, man, God was better to them than they would ever be to themselves. But he tempted them with pride and, you know, that you, something is being held back from you. The right, proper response should have been that, you know what, I'm not God. He told me not to eat of this tree. I'm not God. It's not for me to figure out why he said what he said. He's God. I'm not. There's only one God. I'm not him. And they just should have submitted themselves and have found that place. Man, I am more than content to not be running my life not to be ruling my life. I love it. God has done so much better for me than I could have ever done for myself. I leaned over to Jeremy this morning and said this when Charlie and Jill were singing that song, How Great Thou Art. That was my father's favorite song and he died when I was 12 years old, just a couple of days after I'd turned 12. And I remember standing there in the church and, and I was just a couple of feet away from his casket looking at my father's body as a 12-year-old boy. And they were singing, How Great Thou Art. And that seemed so contrary to what I was experiencing. And I remember praying as a 12-year-old boy and saying, God, if you're great, then take control of my life. Reveal yourself to me. And man, as a 12-year-old kid, I didn't even know what I was asking for. But God is so faithful. God has blessed me so much. Man, I feel like I'm the most blessed person on the planet. God has been good to me. Jamie and I were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. We nearly starved to death for years because of my mistakes. It wasn't God's fault. It was my own stupidity. But now... God is just blessing us. In the last five years, we built $75 million worth of buildings debt-free, and we are just getting started. And I'm telling you, God has blessed us, blessed us, blessed us, and I, it is not because I knew what I was doing. You can ask Paul. 
Paul is my CEO. I think I'll have him come up and receive an offering sometime during the week here. But Paul will tell you that, man, when he came into our ministry, he brought his uh, uh, accountant in with him. And after two days, he says, something is seriously wrong here. He said, he says, you're bankrupt on paper and yet you're still functioning. He just threw away all of our records and he says, we're going to go through and figure out what's happening. And it took about a week of them being there. But anyway, he taught me some things. And Paul can tell you that when he came in, I didn't know anything. Here's Dean Radke. He's smiling. He's on my board. And Dean is this executive, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, he's awesome. He travels all over teaching people how to run ministries, took the limited to the world's largest retailer and stuff like this. And he can tell you that I am not a businessman. It is not, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know God and God just tells me what to do. And he, and God will make you look good. If you just keep your mouth shut and don't tell people how dumb you are, they'll think you're really smart. Amen. I already blew that. But I'm telling you, this is so, it's wonderful just to not have any care about anything. It's awesome. And you know, I'm not saying this in pride by any means. I pray that you understand, but I, I guarantee you there's people right now that are probably listening to me and thinking, I'm not sure about all of this. This is different than everything I've ever been taught. But look what God has done in my life and ministry. And most of you it. I'm not saying that in pride. I'm saying in thankfulness to God. I'm saying, man, I don't know how you can argue with it. God has blessed me. God has blessed this ministry. It is phenomenal what he's doing. People's lives are being changed all over the world. And it's through a guy that is not a businessman, doesn't know what he's doing. Man, if God can use me, God can use anybody. He's looking for the weak things of the world. So you got to be found in him, not having your own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Look down here in the 19th verse. Let me jump ahead. He's talking about, well, in the 18th verse, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross. What makes you an enemy of the cross? You know, again, I could spend a lot of time on this, but the cross here is talking about that Jesus paid for your sins Jesus bore. You do not have to bear it yourself. It is not through all of your self-denial, through your effort. Jesus did it and he just offers us right standing with God. And not only the initial born again experience, but everything. Joy, peace, healing, deliverance, prosperity, anything. All comes through what Jesus did, not through what we do. So when he talks about people being the enemy of the cross, it's talking about people who are trying to obtain these goals without Jesus. They're doing it through their effort, through their flesh, all of the things that he'd been talking against. And in verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction. The end of doing things your own way is failure. It's destruction. And then look at this. He's describing those who are the enemy of the cross, whose God is their belly. <laughs> That's pretty descriptive. You know what this is talking about people to just live for themselves. It's all about, man, your appetites are driving, your lust are driving you. You aren't in control of yourself. You know, Jamie just brought this to my attention a couple of months ago, but she was reading the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And if you read this in all of the modern translations, I'm not against other translations, but I really do believe the King James is the best just because of the way that it goes into depth. You have to think about it and let the Holy Spirit help you some. But most modern day translations make things such a surface answer that there isn't any depth left to it. And for instance, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the spirits, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Most translations will say self-control instead of temperance. And did you know what? Temperance is self-control. It's not totally wrong, but it's shallow. Temperance, if you look it up in the Greek, is specifically self-control in diet, food and drink. 
And when you just say self-control, you miss some of this. This is saying that people, their God is their belly. Did you know gluttony is the Christian accepted <coughs> sin? Most Christians can't fellowship without eating. There's nothing wrong with eating. I eat, I've eaten today. I'll probably eat again today. Amen. I'm not against it, but I'm saying there is self-control. And very few Christians exercise self-control. And he's saying this here as a, as a descriptive or characteristic of people who are just living out of their own ability. If you are living under the control of the Spirit of God, you aren't going to be a fat slob. Amen. Thank you for that thunder of silence. <laughs> I love you. I'm not against anybody, but I'm just saying that God, their God is their belly whose glory is in their shame, whose glory is in all of their accomplishments. These are some hard things that I'm saying, but this is scripture. This is what the apostle Paul is saying. The guy that wrote half of the New Testament, the guy who turned the world upside down. The guy who here we are 2,000 years later talking about him and people want to just cherry pick and choose certain things that he said. But here he is saying that he had no confidence in the flesh. He counted, he took by authority all of the great accomplishments that he had and considered them like dung compared to knowing Christ. He wanted to be found in Christ and his righteousness. And he's contrasting this with other people whose God is their belly, who glory in their shame who talk about all of their accomplishments, who take pride in all of their things instead of taking pride in what Jesus has done in their life. Man, these are strong statements. And I'm telling you, you can't really appreciate the grace of God until you understand that it's undeserved, it's unmerited, as long as you think that somehow or another you war warrant this, that it's because of your great looks, because of your great things that you've done that God is being so good to you. Man, the moment you do that, you make yourself vulnerable to the devil whose glory is in their shame and they mind earthly things. The apostle Paul went on to say, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, he says, while we look at things that aren't seen, because everything that can be seen is temporal. That means temporary, subject to change, but the things that cannot be seen are eternal. He was looking at things that weren't just in the natural. He wasn't looking at his physical accomplishments. He was looking at spiritual things, at what God had done in his life. Did you know when you base your life on who you are in Christ and what God has called you to do, those things are not carnal. They aren't temporal. They can't be touched. But when you base your life on natural things, man, it's shaky. Anything that is natural, anything that is physical is subject to change. You know, in 2002, we had these fires start out by our house and it covered 144,000 acres. And we were evacuated for two weeks from our home. And um, all of my neighbors were loading up moving vans and moving things and things like this. Jamie and I got our papers and pictures that couldn't be replaced. And we prayed over our property and believed it would be protected, and it was. But as we were getting ready to leave, Jamie just said, you know, I agree with you. I believe all of our stuff is safe. This fire is not going to destroy our property. But then she says, but it's just stuff. And she said, if we lost everything we had, said we had fun getting it, we'd have fun getting it back. And she says, it's just stuff. And, and you know what? If you were to come to my house, I designed the house. We built it. It's our dream home. But it would take one truck to move Jamie's stuff <laughs> and one truck to move the rest of the house. I mean, Jamie has that house exactly the way she wants it. And yet, you know what? Her heart's not on it. It's just stuff. And yet there's other people that if your stuff gets touched, you just get depressed. I remember going to church and we had a brand new car and uh, it was the first day we had driven it. So I had the dealer tags on it and a woman at church backed into our brand new car and dented it and she came out and she recognized me and oh, I'm just so sorry. And she was crying and, and I said, it's just stuff. She says, but it's brand new. You don't even have the tags. I says, it doesn't matter. It's not that big. I had a guy that I brought up to our house to fix our satellite dish and 
I drove him up in my brand new pickup. I had to buy two new vehicles in one week. Long story, but man, it was a bad situation. I said, I'm not, I got enough problems. I don't need problems with my vehicles when I go home. I went out and bought two brand new vehicles in one week. Still had the dealer tags on them. So I drove him up in my pickup and we had ice on my hill. My hill is a 15 degree road. And with ice on, he was just amazed that that car came up there and it didn't slip or anything. And I said, man, that's nothing. You ought to see my other vehicle. It's even better. So I had just kind of pulled up and parked uh, you know, caddy corner in front of my garage. And then he went in and fixed the satellite and he says, could we ride down that other vehicle? I said, sure. So I put him in my other vehicle, opened the door and backed my brand new Subaru into my brand new Ford. <laughs> Wrecked both of them. And this guy just, I can't believe you did this. And I said, it's just stuff. It can all be fixed. It's not that big of a deal. But you know, there's some of you that if you were to get a scratch on your car, if you were to have something happen, man, your whole day is ruined because you mind earthly things. Now, again, we need those kind of things. I'm not saying that you don't take care of stuff, but I'm saying that our reaction and the things that bother us, it's an indication of where you live. It's an indication of, have you counted all of your flesh as nothing, as dung? Are you putting your emphasis on spiritual things, who you are in Christ and your eternity? You know, it says in Romans chapter eight, it says those that are carnal mind earthly things. You can tell pretty much where you are, whether you're spiritual or carnal, not by that sick look that you have on your face or whether you have your collar turned around backwards or something like that. Man, it's where's your mind? What are you focused on? Are you thinking about spiritual things? And in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir because this is Friday morning and here you are listening to me at a hotel, amen. You guys are not your normal run-of-the-mill Christian. But yet we still, we just mind earthly things, our confidence in all of these other things. There is, there is such a place of security when you get to where your life is bound up in God. You know, God has blessed us with all of these buildings and things that we're doing. It is awesome, but that is not where my joy is. And I've prayed over all of our assets. I believe they're blessed. I believe they're protected. But you know what? If I lost everything I have, it's just stuff. And I'd have it back again with interest in a short period of time. My life is not bound up in all of these things. I was at uh, Kenneth Copeland's minister's conference and I heard a friend of mine, Happy Caldwell, he just uh, resigned his church a few years back and he spent, I think, 30 years building this church and I forget how many millions of dollars, multi-millions of dollars of facilities, but the Lord told him it was time for him to move on and he's now started the Victory Television Network and he's beginning to build it and he just took his church and I'm not even sure, 20 million or whatever uh, dollars worth of assets and turned it over to a man who had been in his church, but he was out on the mission field and he called him up and had him come back and take over the church. And he just walked away from 30 years worth of ministry. His baby that he birthed gave it to somebody else and has moved on to another phase of life. And he was talking about this at the minister's conference and then he gave an invitation and he says, some of you, as you get older, he says, it's time for you to pass the baton. It's time for you to raise up somebody else. And he says, how many of you would be willing to do it? And he says, I want you, if you're willing to, you know, you'd be willing to go anywhere, do anything if that's what God called you to do. I want you to stand and just make that commitment. And you know, it only took me about five seconds to think about it, but I would walk away from everything I've got. If you could convince me that the Lord wanted me to move to Africa and live in a grass hut, I'd walk away from everything. I'd give it to somebody else because that's not where my life is. Now, I might have to do it without Jamie. <laughs> I'm not sure Jamie would live. But anyway, I'd be willing to go live in a grass hut if, that's, if you could convince me. I mean, I praise God for the awesome things he's done. I'm so thankful for everything that God has done, but that is not where my life is. My confidence isn't in those things. It is my relationship with the Lord. 
Man, I had the Lord back when I was pouring concrete. I was leading two or three people a day to the Lord, and I was just having a great time loving God. I could go back to pouring concrete again and have just a great time loving the Lord. My life is not bound up in the ministry or in the assets or in any of this. And I'm telling you, when you get your life and have your confidence in all of your accomplishments, you've set yourself up for a failure because all of those things are temporary, subject to change. Satan can affect physical things. But when your life is based on who Jesus is, his love for you, what he's done for you, who you are in him, those things are never going to fluctuate. And that's where we need to live our life. That's where God is wanting us to live. Amen. And brothers and sisters, I know just like it started in Philippians chapter three, you know, to say the same things to me indeed is not grievous, but it's necessary for you. I know that many of us have heard these things, but again, how many of us live this way to where our life is just totally taken up in our relationship with the Lord and we're focused on that? The reason we go up and down in our emotions is because we are focused on temporal things and temp temporal things change. There's going to be good and bad times. But man, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When your focus is in him, you ought to be able to rejoice regardless of what's happening. Paul wrote all of these things in Philippians from prison, facing execution, and he was just rejoicing. There's 17 times in Philippians that he talks about joy, rejoice, rejoicing. It's the happiest book he ever wrote from prison because his confidence and his whole life was found in the Lord. It wasn't him living, it was Christ living in him. And man, that's a great way to live. Amen. I recommend it. So, Father, we are thankful for these truths, and I just pray that the Holy Spirit take these truths today and apply it to every single person's life. Father, as Jeremy was teaching, we cast all of our care about everything over on you. Father, only one thing is needful. Only one thing is important, and that is sitting at your feet and knowing you, and we just give you the care, the worry of everything. We take by control, by command, with authority, with authority, 